Hi, I'd like to resume the conversation on gene regulation to talk about epigenetics. In particular, we'll start with uh, DNA methylation. Epi means around, so it's not truly genetics. It's not changing the base uh, sequence, C, A, G, and T. But what, what can happen is you can methylate. You can add a methyl group to C cytosines. And we'll see methyl C on the next slide. But for now, we'll just I'll note that in particular, these enzymes like to methyl, methylate the C bases when they occur in a CG island. And these, sometimes you say CPG island, which is sort of infer inferring that it's a 5' prime to 3' prime direction. So when C precedes G. And uh, you have some CG clusters in, in promoter regions. So when these get methylated, different types of gene regulation will occur. In particular, many genes will get turned off if their promoters are methylated. But I'll say as an aside, methylation can also turn on some other promoters. But the general case is that it's going to turn things off. And now you've, whereas before you might have had a protein repressing this gene, now you've got covalent additions to the DNA itself that's going to make this gene turned off. And now this repressor protein could leave if it needed to or, or did by, um, by random events. The gene would still be turned off with these methyl marks here in the promoter. Okay, so here we see uh, the structure of cytosine and here is a methyl group that gets put on the five position and we call this 5-methyl-C. There are a few other locations of methylation. For instance, A can also get methylated, but the, um, the most important of these is, is 5-methylcytosine. So we see that this is referred to as epigenetics because this methylation status can get inherited. See the case where you have um, fully methylated uh, DNA. Again, since C, P, G islands are palindromic, both strands are methylated. Now we're going to get DNA replication. You're going to have semi-conservative replication. So each cell inherits one of the um, original strands. And this is called hemimethylated, meaning half methylated. And this is a signal to the cell that uh, we should methylate this other cytosine base. And so what's being inherited is the methylation status at a particular gene. So the daughter cells are going to stay methylated. And I guess I should have pointed out that this figure is highlighting the fact that if the C and G is not methylated originally, it will also not be methylated in the daughter cell. Events at the protein level we found can be inherited also. Uh, and that is that if a gene is turned off and there are many copies of repressor proteins in a promoter region, when the DNA is split or replicated that the bound protein will sort stochastically ensuring that both daughter cells get some of the protein which aided by cooperative binding will serve as a nidus for additional proteins to bind at the promoter. So in this case, the protein being bound at a promoter is inherited to uh, daughter cells. Methylation of DNA and protein being bound to DNA being inherited, again, that's sort of a generic term for what's referred to as epigenetics. So we've talked almost exclusively about transcriptional regulation. And I've mentioned before that you can also, once an mRNA is made, control how much protein is made from uh, that mRNA. And actually, it's, it's highly frequent, as we'll see in the third portion of the course. Um, I'll give, I just want to give a flavor of it right now because it's, it's not as well characterized. But here's an mRNA molecule, which has a, s a bit of a stem loop structure here. And here you can see the ribosomal binding site, which is uh, where the ribosome has to bind in order to make this protein. Uh, 
uh, if a translation repressor protein binds this mRNA, that's going to occupy the ribosomal binding site, and this is going to turn this mRNA off so it's not making protein. Why might you want to do that, you ask? Well, if you want to have, you want to enable a quick response to a certain stimulus, you might want to make the mRNA ahead of time and just sort of occupy it and hold it uh, until you need that protein. Then you can make the protein much more quickly when you need it. Another way genes can be regulated is if the ribosomal binding site is here in the stem loop structure, and these might be some genes that get turned on in terms of heat response, the increased temperature would melt this uh, stem structure and now exposing the ribosomal binding site allowing this protein to get made. And there are many others as well. I'd like to conclude these series of videos to talk about how people study these important interactions between a DNA binding protein and a specific DNA binding sequence. Important binding sites for proteins can be are conserved more than surrounding sequence. Um, things that are important for function tend to get conserved. Things that are less important or not important can drift evolutionarily. Mutations or base pair changes there will not really affect function. But especially in the case when you have a lock and key type scenario, uh, those sequences have an important function and it's also harder to mutate them. Uh, if you mutate a sequence without mutating also the protein that binds to it, you're more likely to have a less functional interaction. It's like if you have a lock and key that works and you're only going to change the key, uh, you're going to tend to be breaking the interaction between the lock and key. So binding sites for regulatory proteins tend to be conserved. In, in this case, this was identified computationally as a sequence that's bound. As you can see, there are other sequences here that are well bound and they may have functions as well. On this slide, the test is called a gel mobility shift assay, or also sometimes it's called EMSA, or electromobility shift assay. And it can be used to test one or two things. You can test to see if a protein interacts with a DNA. You could add, first of all, you would run a gel electrophoresis um, of just naked DNA, and then you can add a protein, and now the protein DNA complex will migrate more slowly, and that will tend to create bands uh, at apparently higher molecular weight. Although the DNA fragment hasn't changed, the fact that it's now associated with a protein uh, causes it to uh, travel more slowly. So you might just use this method when you have the question that you have a particular protein you're interested in, and you wonder if it binds to DNA, or a specific DNA sequence. You could use generic DNA sequence, or you could add just a specific oligo and see if its electrophoretic mobility is altered, or the, if the gel mobility shifts when I... Another question you might ask is, if I have a DNA sequence that I think is important for regulating my gene and I want to find any proteins that bind to it. Well, the key step will be to fish those proteins out using that DNA uh, attached to a bead where I can pull it out uh, from all other proteins. But um, in order to, to get pure enough results, um, and you're going to test all cell proteins, you're going to take a column with agarose beads that have DNA attached to them, and you're going to add the proteins. The proteins that come through first are proteins that don't interact with DNA at all. But a lot of proteins will interact with DNA uh, non-specifically, and so they will be they will stick on the column at first, but then you'll add a salt wash to inter interfere with the interactions between protein and DNA, and then those proteins will come off, and now you have a group of proteins that are enriched for the fact that they interact in general with DNA. Now, again, this was just uh, random DNA, generic DNA. You're just seeing what proteins random will generally bind DNA. Now you're interested in the specific sequence, so you take agarose beads and you just add your specific sequence. 
you'll put the proteins on. Some proteins that don't interact specifically with that sequence will come through. Uh, proteins that do interact with that sequence will bind and then you will add a high salt wash that uh, very vigorously interferes with the interaction. These proteins will then come off the DNA. They'll be eluded in the column. So in principle, what you have is purified protein of the protein that interacts with your DNA sequence. The last technique we'll talk about is a method called ChIP-Seq. Uh, and that CHIP is a, a brief acronym for chromatin immunoprecipitation. And the question you're answering is, I have a protein I'm interested in, and I want to know everywhere where it's binding in the genome, all thousands of places where it binds. Well, the concept is pretty simple, but it's only recently that uh, this method has started to work well. And one of the investigators in, in the BME department, James Galligan, is one of the world's leaders at this. When cells are growing, we're going to add a little bit of a molecule called formaldehyde to it. And what that does is that induces a covalent crosslink between DNA and proteins that are bound to it. And now we're going to take an antibody that's specific for the protein that we're interested in, an antibody we're interested here in this yellow protein, and we're going to immunoprecipitate it, meaning we're going to use this antibody to pull the yellow protein out of the soup of all the DNA molecules and all random proteins bound to DNA. Then you can reverse the formaldehyde crosslinks, removing the protein from that, and then with high throughput sequencing you can sequence all the DNA fragments that get pulled out of the cell based on the fact that you're pulling on the protein. So the typical result here is you'll 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 find literally thousands of places where this protein is binding in the genome and you can start to map that out and start to build uh, circuit diagrams of what's going on in the cell that are incredibly complex, uh, which I should say is not the same as the initial circuits which I showed you, which are local or synthetically engineered to achieve a specific function. But before you can understand genetic regulation at the level of the whole organism, this, these are the kinds of data that are incredibly useful for that fact. Okay, uh, thanks very much. That concludes.